Hello everyone, I'm Rose Jacobs and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Justin Peters. Justin is the Executive Chairman of Lee Creek Energy. Here at Calcine we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and help you understand how you can create one. Justin Peters, the Executive Chairman of Lee Creek Energy. His rich experience in the mining industry and has been associated with industry representative bodies and various state and federal environmental departments and authorities. Lee Creek Energy Limited is an ASX listed company focused on developing its Lee Creek Energy project located near Adelaide in South Australia. The Lee Creek Energy project or LCEP is Lee Creek Energy's flagship project developing low cost nitrogen based fertiliser for local and export agricultural markets. Located in Lee Creek in South Australia, which is 550 k's north of Adelaide, it will be the lowest cost sovereign producer of urea, providing additional security to a critical product for the Australian agricultural sector and helping to avoid risks associated with transport, exchange rates, commodity prices and import logistics. Lee Creek will be carbon neutral from 2020 and has a comprehensive environment, social and governance strategy to achieve this. Justin, thanks for joining me today. Yes, good morning, Rose. Nice to be here. Great. Well, Lee Creek Energy Project is set to be one of the lowest cost producers for urea for the domestic agricultural market. Can you start off by introducing us to the project and some of the history and what you're aiming to accomplish? Um, you cover a lot of it in your introduction at the start. Um, Lee Creek Energy Project is actually located at, at Lee Creek, obviously, 500 kilometres north of Adelaide. A great location, good in infrastructure. We have a, a train line right to the actual site. We have a highway, um, an air um, strip not far from the site, and two towns very close. We chose the location because the infrastructure was already in place. Um, it was an old coal mine that had been used by the Electricity Trust of South Australia. And then after that was being used by Alinta. And then when Flinders Power finally closed the um, Port Augusta coal station and power station there, uh, we took over the site for the development of the energy project. We decided during that process that we were working with the government for the approvals processes, that um, we've worked with them now for five years out at site. And two years ago, we developed the first trial to actually produce the gas and to demonstrate our environment and social credibility. Um, we were very lucky in that we had two towns very, very close by, both in Copley and Lee Creek, which meant that we had a good workforce nearby. We had good facilities nearby with the school, hospital. Um, so the location turned out to be exactly the right location for us, for our project. Well, it's certainly a rich history and an ideal location by the sounds of it. So if we look at some of the dynamics at play in the urea industry, why does Australia's agriculture sector need another fertiliser producer? And the amount of uh, fertiliser used in Australia is actually wow. quite large. It, it spreads from phosphate right and nitrogen products like urea. Uh, Australia is a, a vast place with a, a very, very agricultural history. So if you look at most of your grain industry, wheat and barley, um, your cane industry, but mostly in South Australia and in the more arid areas, those crops cannot be productive or fully productive without a nitrogen-based fertiliser actually within their product stream and with their usage. Traditionally, urea has been a mixture of imported and domestically produced. So about 300,000 tonne of it is actually produced in Australia. Nearly all of the 2 million, 2.4 million ton um, outside of that 300,000 ton is actually imported from overseas. And that comes from places like the Middle East, um, Southeast Asia, and some from China. And one of the things that we noticed about the process was that there was a lot of risk involved in getting it into Australia and transporting it. There were transport costs, but also the actual product itself is subject to vagaries of gas prices. And for those who know how urea is actually manufactured, um, a gas is used, that gas is then split into a nitrogen, hydrogen stream, and then it's combined with CO2 to produce urea. 
the crop yields improve dramatically when urea is actually introduced to a crop. So we could see that firstly there was a market in Australia, secondly that nearly all of it was imported from overseas and we wanted to be a low cost, a low cost domestic producer that could actually supply the local community and the local farmers with an Australian made product. And on top of that, we were well aware of the fact that with the CO2 issues around the globe, that if we weren't able to deal with our CO2 emissions, then it was going to be very difficult for us to actually get a social licence. Well, you certainly seized a prime opportunity with that and it looks as though Lee Creek Energy appears to have been busy over the past six months in particular, especially with engineering, procurement, construction and finance contracts being awarded to South Korean engineering company Day Lim. What did you agree on in particular and how does this progress the project for you? Um, look, signing the EPC contract with Day Lim was huge. The reason for that being that Dalian has the credibility. It's one of the largest EPC contracting companies in the world. It has a great reputation and it's worked in our area most importantly. So they've worked in ammonia production, they've worked and built ammonia and a fertiliser facility. We recognised internally that a company our size didn't have the skill set for the actual production of ammonia, the construction of a plant, the engineering to get us to that point. So we had a look at the EPC companies around the world and we vetted several of them and we came to the conclusion that Daling was the right fit for us. So we concentrate on the production of the gas and the EPC contract with Daling will construct the ammonia plant and the fertiliser plant or the urea plant on the end of the ammonia plant. So it was huge for us. But it was huge for us in several ways. One of them was, was validation. And that is that a company the size of Daling um, doesn't have um, the need or even the desire to work with companies that are high-risk companies that they don't believe in. So we'd done a huge amount of due diligence with DLM. They were comfortable with the gas we produced. They were comfortable with the location. They were comfortable with our ability to be able to produce that gas as a feedstock for the ammonia and urea plant. So we had that validation from DLM right from the start. Most importantly with DLM though, they were with us on the securing of finance for that project. So part of the actual EPC contract we signed with them was also a funding component within that. And Dalim have organised through their banks in Korea up to 70% funding of the actual project itself. And this was huge. It, go, it goes without saying that when you're looking at a $2.6 billion project, that actually raising that money for the company outside is actually very difficult. So the fact that we could partner with Dalim and also resolve the first 70% funding of the project was massive for us. Um, and it's something we're excited about. We're working with them daily at the moment. They've already started employing in Australia and they've already put 170 people into the project already to get this moving. It's a very exciting partnership indeed. And in the previous quarter alone, you've also successfully completed a placement for $18 million. How does Lee Creek plan to use the funds to advance the project? Um, it, look, it allows us to fast track things and that is that um, there are long lead items that needed to be ordered. So, for instance, the generators uh, that we're going to use to produce electricity have already been ordered. So that allowed us to place those orders so we had the funds to be able to complete what we needed to. But it also allowed us to look at the issues of licensing. When you put in ammonia plants or urea plants, um, they're off the shelf items. But there's a licensing fee that's involved in that that allowed us to address that as well. Um, and it just gave us that flexibility to move quicker with dailing to get things done much, much quicker out of sight to actually get the employment of people on board and to move the project further ahead. So that fundraising was a great one for us. It was um, a surprisingly quick process in that the attention and the interest in the agricultural market, in fertiliser and the production of food um, and the fact that the sovereign product is something that the investors were very keen on and were happy to invest in. Well, it sounds like speed is um, certainly of the essence here, but you also recently announced to the market that Lee Creek Energy will likely be the first large-scale fertiliser project in the world to be carbon neutral. Which steps do you need to undertake this? And talk us through that. Um, it's an important process, and that was, as I said before, that if you don't have a solution to your CO2 footprint, then you're going to start to have problems with different regulatory groups. You're going to have problems if there's a carbon tax it's actually bought in and we had to address those issues from a risk point of view. 
the first part of that was the actual production of urea consumes around about 70 75 percent of the CO2 that's produced within the process. And that is that it's actually introduced back into the hydrogen nitrogen stream as CO2, and that's used to make urea. But there was a, an area left over, roughly around about 30% CO2, has not been dealt with within the process. So you have to find an external way of dealing with that CO2. We're fortunately, great in that um, the traditional carbon sequestration processes always have several challenges. The first is a lot of the CO2 that's normally captured from industry is post-stack emission, and that is that the CO2 actually goes up the stack. You've got to find a way of separating from other gases within that at high volume. So there's a cost factor there. We don't have that issue because we can actually strip the CO2 out of the gas right at the front end when we, we actually take the gas out of the ground. The second issue that most people have is transport, and that is that there's no sink or there's no ability to be able to sequester outside. So they have to actually compress that CO2, either pipeline it or transport it to a location that can accept that CO2. So somewhere like the Cooper Basin would be one possible area. Um, ex old um, oil fields is another area. But we're lucky at site in that we have deep, deep coal. And as long as we have that deep coal, we have the ability to, be able to sequester CO2 in those old coal seams that are there that are deep. So we have that solution where we actually don't have to transport the gas. And then the third thing, that sets us apart also is that the infrastructure is already there. We already have the wells, we already have the compressors there at site, we already have the electricity. So we're one of those unique organisations that will actually be able to strip the CO2 out at the start and then be able to re inject it back down and um, deep into the coal seam at a later date. It's something that no one else has been able to do. So we're very comfortable with our claim that we would be the only fertiliser company in the world that has to both produce their feedstock at site and actually to deal with their CO2 site. You're definitely in a very unique position there. So with that, in your opinion, how can the Australian energy and industrial sectors in general work towards carbon neutrality in the coming years? Um, I think it's going to be very difficult. I think that it's very easy to come out and make the statement that you're going to go to zero by 2030 or 2050. If you're saying 2050, most of us won't be around by then. So whether people deliver on that promise by that stage is a moot point, but it's not going to come without cost. And I think all companies now are factoring in. They're required to anyway um, through the regulatory bodies, but there's a cost factor involved. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the challenges for some of the industries that are actually are very um, high in their CO2 production and how they're going to deal with that. And there's really only two ways they can deal with it. And that is reduce the amount of CO2 they produce to the bare minimum and still operate as a company and then do offsets for that CO2, which comes at the cost. And I think that's the only way that companies are going to get there. It's easy when you think about power. You know, the, the traditional power generation in Australia in the past has been coal-fired power or gas turbine. They've been replaced with wind power and solar power, which have a zero footprint. They do have a CO2 footprint in the production of the equipment and materials, but in the production of electricity, they have a zero footprint. And that's one industry that you can see renewables can step in and resolve the CO2 problem. But there are a lot of other industries, like your smelters, um, your iron companies, that are going to struggle to reach this without having to make some major changes to their practice. Justin, thank you for your valuable input and it's been lovely chatting with you today. Very wise advice indeed. Right, thank you, Rose. Thank you. And with that, we'll sign off for today. Watch this space for more. Until then, stay safe and invest wise with Calkine.